I'm Sarah Howell. I'm the chairman of the board of the Houston Maritime Center. And it is my privilege to welcome William J. Prom. William graduated from the Naval Academy in 2009, commissioned into the Marine Corps. And then subsequent to his uh, Marine Corps service has entered private life and work, uh, but maintains his uh, vast knowledge and interest in Naval history. So he's here tonight to talk about a topic that I'm very excited about. My fifth great grandfather was actually part of uh, the shipbuilding activity that he's going to discuss tonight. And uh, so it, it's, it's really exciting for me and I didn't even pick this topic. So it's working out wonderfully well. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone and William. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us this evening here in person and those of you on Zoom too. Hello, Grandma. Uh, and also thank you to those in the future watching on YouTube. I'm excited to talk to you today about a topic I've been passionate about for several years now. Uh, but before I begin, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. I'm not a sailor, nor am I a shipbuilder. Uh, but uh, during my time in the Marine Corps, as was mentioned, I did get to spend some time on ship generally between times sitting on rocks in different places around the world. So I'm gonna apologize uh, before I advance in this uh, that I may misspeak a bit when I talk about boat stuff. I also wanna make sure that I leave some time for questions here, so I'm gonna jump right into this. I'll start by setting the scene for you. It's February 24th, 1813. And for the last 10 days, you and your team of 25 carpenters have been traveling for over 400 miles through the snow and over the ice, uh, iced over lakes of New York and Pennsylvania on horse-drawn sleighs, only to arrive at your destination at Presque Isle and uh, near Erie, Pennsylvania in the middle of a snowstorm. So basically the last week we had here in Texas. Uh, you're expecting to find a shipyard where the US Navy's Lake Erie fleet was being built. But as the snow kept falling, you see, all you see is what barely qualifies as a campsite. Eventually, a local mariner, Daniel Dobbins, arrives and assures you, this is what you came to, you came to the right place. And those mounds of snow over there by the water, that's the unfinished ships that you're supposed to make. This is the situation that one of our subjects, Noah Brown, found himself in in 1813 in February. You see back east, the war with Great Britain wasn't going well. The US Navy won several noteworthy frigate duels early in the war, but by the time Noah Brown started his race to Lake Erie, the British blockade was beginning to close its grip on the East Coast. On February 4th, 10 days before he left in 1813, the British blockade at Hampton Roads had stopped the frigate Constellation from exiting, uh, from going out to sea from Hampton Roads. And it never left Hampton Roads for the rest of the war. This was just the first of many of these famous ships that were neutralized during the blockade. So even as a sideshow to Great Britain's greater war with uh, Napoleon at the time, their military was dominating over the US at this point in the War of 1812. Now, the focus of my presentation, as you can see here, is gonna be on the war on the lakes, especially the shipbuilding there. But this blockade is important, as you'll see later on. It plays a big role in what's about to happen. So now, in a thick forest blanketed in snow at the edge of a frozen lake, Brown and his men unpacked their gear. Their race to New York was just to get to the starting line for their real competition, building warships better and faster than their British counterparts. So who was Noah Brown? He and his younger brother, Adam, grew up in New York and Connecticut during the American Revolution. Many of the details of lives have been lost or, as I hope, just not uncovered yet. We only have an approximate birth date for Noah and none at all for his younger brother, Adam. Their father and three brothers fought in the Revolutionary War with the Continental Army, but Noah and Adam were too young to fight. Noah left home at 15 in 18, or sorry, in 1785 to apprentice as a carpenter. And Adam followed not long after. 
They worked building houses in Connecticut until uh, 1804 when they took a contract to build a schooner in Newark in Upper Canada, just over the border from Buffalo on Lake Ontario. Now, neither had any formal training or apprenticeship in shipbuilding, so this is kind of a, an unexpected uh, shift for them. But they kept that shipbuilding. And by 1806, the US Navy had actually hired them to build a series of gunboats. This contract with the Navy, however, didn't really change their fortunes. Uh, the following summer, they went down to North Carolina where they had to harvest live oak, uh, uh, which we'll discuss a bit more later, uh, for the, uh, intended for the frigate New York, which they then came back to work on in the shipyard there until 1808 when they opened their own shipyard, which you can see here on the map, the Red Star, uh, where it was located in Brooklyn near the modern day Manhattan Bridge. And we also have a, a sketch here, a contemporary sketch of their shipyard. Now the brothers kept building merchant ships at that time till the US declared war on Great Britain in June, 1812. That's when they started building privateers. So these were vessels built by individuals or more often groups of investors to conduct gear to course or commerce rating on British shipping. And they actually built some of the most successful of the war like uh, Prince de Neuf Chateau, uh, General Armstrong and Warrior. Now this talk started with Lake Erie. So what, why did we start there? What's so important about Lake Erie? Why did Noah Brown and his men expend so much energy to get there so fast? Well, in the early 19th century, the northern border of the US was a dense and mountainous wilderness. The open expanse of the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain and the St. Lawrence River were provided avenues for armies and more importantly, their supply chains to move. When the war started, Secretary of the Navy Paul Hamilton appointed Captain Isaac Chauncey to command forces on both Lake Ontario and Erie. But Hamilton warned him, you will have a number of vessels to build and the timber is yet to be cut. Unfortunately, efforts at Lake Erie began poorly. Chauncey selected uh, his selection to command the squadron, Jesse Elliott, and Hamilton's choice to build the fleet, Daniel Dobbins, disagreed so much that they operated separate, uh, separate building sites 100 miles apart. See uh, Black Rock and Presque Isle there. When Chauncey came to inspect their progress or lack of on December 31st, 1812, he found both sites lacked skilled craftsmen and those that hadn't deserted had no lodging. Dobbin's gunboats at Presque Isle were too small, too few and too far behind schedule. In Elliott's Black Rock site, it did have a captured British brig, but it was up on stocks waiting for alterations. The carpenters left in October after a barrage from Fort Erie. The remaining vessels they had there were pulled up a creek out of the fort's range. And Chauncey complained to the Secretary of the Navy that he found stores and equipment distributed about in almost every direction for 20 miles. Fortunately, around the same time, President Madison appointed a new and much more active uh, Secretary of the Navy, William Jones. Jones had a keen understanding of the importance of the lakes and the waterways of the American frontier. He set about improving the Navy's position there. So he directed Chauncey to build two brigs at Lake Erie, in addition to the gunboats that he thought were already completed. But only three months remained until the ice was gonna clear the lake. Chauncey needed a change and fast. He sought Master Commandant Oliver Hazard Perry for command and old acquaintances from New York to lead construction, no one Adam Brown. You see, before the war, Chauncey had commanded the New York Navy Yard right next to the Brown's shipyard conveniently. He knew the quality of their work. He had built, they had built and repaired gunboats for him in the past. He probably felt confident hiring them, but it's really hard to say he had any idea how momentous a decision this would be. Chauncey urged the Browns to make for Erie immediately and to build two brigs with the following specifications. These vessels must be so constructed that they can draw and be made to draw not exceeding six and a half to seven feet of water. And at the same time, possess qualities of sailing fast, bearing, at, sailing fast and bearing their guns with ease. Their frame and et cetera will be left entirely to yourself. It's important to remember that at this time, the US Navy had no centralized ship construction process. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Joshua Humphreys, uh, who designed and built the first six frigates, uh, made popular in Ian Toll's book, Six Frigates. 
Well, his position no longer existed in the Navy. President Madison relieved the official naval constructor shortly before the war and never appointed a replacement, at least not yet. But even when there was an official ship designer, it was uh, typical for a senior officer like Chauncey to dictate their needs like this. So let's take a look at what he asked for again. A shallow drafted, fast sailing, heavily armed vessel, all conflicting uh, attributes and built fast. Yeah, the, the Venn diagram of this is gonna have a minuscule if not non-existent intersection. Uh, but perhaps as evidence of his trust in the Browns or more likely just the depth of his own responsibility, Chauncey left the Browns with considerable autonomy and provided little more direction in constructing these brigs. Now this almost brings us to where I began with Noah Brown and the carpenters racing across the wilderness in the snowstorm. After receiving their contracts, the Browns immediately hired carpenters and arranged transportation. After receiving the contracts, or sorry, uh, Brown or Adam Brown remained in New York to hire more men, forward supplies, and manage their shipyard while Noah left for that incredible trip. Noah Brown had his work cut out for him. Pres no pun intended. Uh, but Presque Isle had ne a nearly endless supply of timber, but lacked almost all other resources. There's no ironworks or sawmill nearby, no materials for rope, sailcloth, or anchors, no source of ordnance, ammunition, or labor. Everything had to be made there or carried by wagon train. And it took them 10 days over, going over 400 miles from New York City to get there. Now we finally arrived at the starting point uh, of this story with Noah Brown, a handful of carpenters, ambiguous or conflicting ship building plans, a non-existent shipyard, no shelter from the snowstorm around them, and a ticking clock marking the thawing of the lake before naval operations can commence again. Thankfully, Noah Brown didn't waste any time. Only days after his arrival, Dobbins, the man originally hired to build the fleet of ships before being replaced by Brown, offers what I think has to be the highest praise possible from someone in his position in a report to Secretary Jones. He said that Brown appears to be the man that we want in this place in order to drive the business. The keels of the two brigs are laid or ready to lay and a number of the frames made and a house built to live in. Meanwhile, Adam Brown back in New York kept sending men. And by April, they had more than 200. And that's when Noah Brown, as, as he put it later on, we began to drive the business with considerable speed. Yeah. Okay. Now we're getting into some of that technical stuff. So again, remember my disclaimer about a Marine talking boat stuff. Ship construction in the wilderness of Presque Isle followed the same basic principles that you'd see on a traditional shipyard, but with a great many more challenges. In addition to the normal stocks and scaffolding that they, they would have to build, Brown had to also construct a warehouse, guardhouse, mess building, barracks, blacksmith shop, and office building. All the cutting, hewing, and squaring had to be done by hand. To make the lumber, the strong lumber resistant to warping or rotting in the water, Builders typically seasoned timbers uh, for up to a year. Obviously that's not an option for him. They also didn't have the ability to make the choice or choose the choicest uh, materials for warship construction. Uh, as I mentioned that Georgia live oak that they went in harvested in North Carolina earlier. Later on in this war, that's when the constitution earns its famous nickname, Old Ironsides for that Georgia live oak. Again, Brown didn't have that luxury. Instead, he'd send carpenters out with axemen to choose the best available timber. And then they would take down the tree, shape it into planks, and oftentimes add it to the ship later that day. They had to move at an incredible pace. Once the carpenters collected and sorted the timber, they assembled the ship's skeleton, like you can see here, with uh, first laying the keel, then attached the bow stem post and aft stern post, Next came the rib-like frames along the keel and the cross beams above to support the deck. Workers then hammered in plankings over the frame and on the deck. They still had to install the rudder, wheels, capstans, uh, windlasses, pumps, uh, create the interior cabins, do the caulking and further reinforce the hull. Brown and his men worked outside in the late Pennsylvania winter 
in 19th century clothing without power tools from dawn to dusk and often into the night. When asked later in life, Brown would explain, we all this time were driving the vessels as if as, as fast as possible. It appeared as it, uh, that every man was engaged as if on a strife. Then we often appeared before our harbor and several times came to anchor within three miles of us. It got so bad at times that on several occasions when provisions ran so short or conditions were so severe, Brown had to talk down his men from striking and thankfully he did. Now, as I said before, there's no lack of timber there, but almost no other resources. They suffered serious shortages in iron, oakum and pitch. Uh, they were so desperate for materials that at one point Brown led a team to ransack a, a ship frozen in the ice that was abandoned out there. They took about 20 barrels of pork to feed themselves, then took all the rigging, cables, and anything else they could find to use for oakum to seal the seams in the hull's planking. And then, when, uh, then burnt the ship to get any iron they could out of it. And after exhausting all of that to create the oakum, uh, they had to improvise using lead caulking. And interesting, some more recent uh, underwater archeology span has actually found that that lead caulking may have actually been uh, more ideal for the green timber they had to use. Obviously not something he could have known at the time. Now, this is probably the longest anyone has ever talked about Lake Erie in the War of 1812 with no mention of Oliver Hazard Perry. He's kind of synonymous with the battle. Uh, so where is he after all? Uh, he first arrived on March 27th, 1813, about five weeks after, um, after Brown and his first party of 25 arrived. This is in no way a rebuke of him. That's just simply how the orders process works. Uh, not really different today. Um, Perry was a 27 year old master commandant at the time. That's uh, equivalent to a modern or a commander in the modern Navy. So he was young, uh, but he was also experienced enough to know not when to mess with a working system. Uh, he engaged with Brown, saw what was going on and decided to step away. He had nothing more he can really contribute there, which meant he could focus on collecting sails, cannons, powder, and men, all of which he had none of at the time. Now, I've used a few ship descriptions and designations uh, so far on this. Their, their perfect definition isn't uh, that important for understanding the story, especially because there's an exception for every rule in these cases, but I wanna provide a little description here just to help you better picture it in your mind as we go along. So he's building two brigs like we have here on the left. So generally two masts, square rigged. There's also gonna be mention of schooners, generally two or more masts uh, with four and a half sails and then gunboats. Those are gonna be much smaller, but very heavily manned uh, with just one or two guns and uh, being sailed and potentially rowed like a galley, hence all of the, the large crew. Now, Brown launched the first of those gunboats in April and the Briggs, Lawrence, and Niagara by July 4th. In a four month period, Brown's crew built the two 20 gun Briggs, a small schooner, four gunboats, 14 small boats, all the gun carriages, and the rest of the building infrastructure of the expeditious shipyard. It's quite the accomplishment, to say the least, but their work wasn't even done on the lake yet. The Briggs' nine foot draft kept them from passing over the surrounding Presque Isle, the bar surrounding Presque Isle. Now you might say, I thought they were told no more than six and a half to seven feet. Again, back to that Venn diagram, there's, there's trade-offs. If you want a fast sailing, heavily armed ship, it's gonna need a bigger draft. Uh, but uh, Brown had a solution for this. It was a set of barges, which he called camels, uh, which very simply put, you'd put them alongside the ship run timbers between uh, the gum ports, they'd rest on the deck of the barge, you pump all the water out and raise them over. Now, all Perry had to do was not attract the attention of the British while they're already roving the lake as they did that. Uh, and thankfully, over the course of several days of pumping, they were able to do this uh, and get them all over the bar by August 5th. Um, at which point, uh, Lieutenant Robert Barkley, the British squadron commander dismayed, uh, when he reported to his superior, uh, this time has now come, which I have so long feared, that of being obliged to withdraw from this without supplies. On reconnoitering the enemy's squadron this morning, I found them all over the bar. Now with construction complete, Noah Brown and his men returned to New York. 
So shortly after, by September, Perry blockaded Barclays Squadron and put in bay. On the morning of September 10th, Barclays Squadron sought to destroy Perry's. With more long guns and the weather gauge, the battle began in Barclays' favor. He hammered the Americans outside their carronade range, but thankfully and for us, the winds changed. And uh, with that, Perry closed with Barclay and his carronades. That, when the Lawrence suffered too much, he, uh, too much to continue, Perry shifted to the Niagara with the now famous don't give up the ship flag that you can see there. He then broke Barclay's line, raked the Detroit and Queen Charlotte. By the afternoon, the British and the entire British squadron surrendered. The efforts of Perry's victory were immediate. The British could no longer supply themselves over the lake, which helped Major General Harrison to recover Detroit and break up the Tecumseh Confederacy at the Battle of the Thames. The US retained control of the lake for the remainder of the war, which kept Ohio, Pennsylvania, and the Western uh, New York safe for the rest of the war. Now, when Noah Brown returned to Brooklyn, he found his brother hard at work at another ship already, uh, an 18 gun sloop of war for the US Navy. Now, there hadn't been a contract that arrived from the US Navy at this point, but it stands to reason that it's easier to sell a ship that's almost complete rather than one that hasn't been started yet. It also helps when you've been forwarded the designs from the newly appointed uh, ship constructor or naval constructor for the US Navy. Uh, that contract did eventually arrive and the Browns delivered the Sloop of War Peacock in four months. Now, Sloop of War is another designation or another ship type uh, that's uh, a little more nebulous, nebulous, excuse me, than the, like a brig or schooner like I used earlier, especially when you compare it to the British, French or American navies. But generally it's gonna be two to three masts uh, with square rig sails and a flush deck. So like a small frigate. If you've ever been to Baltimore Harbor, the constellation there is a very good example to imagine. Now the Peacock demonstrates the brothers' technical expertise when using a proper shipyard, or traditional ship uh, building methods on a proper shipyard. Secretary Jones described the Peacock as a noble and elegant vessel. Her form combines all the properties of fleetness, stability, and accommodation. The sloop was noted for its speed and considered ideal for its class. It had a similar length, breadth, and armament to the Briggs, Lawrence, and Niagara that they just built. Uh, but since it was ocean going, it didn't need to have such a shallow draft, as you can see in the comparison of the midship frames for the two ships. Where are those, uh, the lake fleets that Brown built on uh, Lake Erie, they were kind of meant for a single decisive engagement. The Peacock, however, was meant to endure. And over the course of the course of the war, it took more prizes than any other ship in the US Navy. And in the following decades was used as a model for future sloops by the US Navy. And it continued to serve into 1841 when it was unfortunately lost at the mouth of the Columbia River during the Wilkes exploring expedition. And after Presque Isle, I imagine sleeping in their own beds, working on a shipyard, building the Peacock probably felt luxurious uh, for the Browns, especially Noah. Uh, but uh, Harrison's vic or Perry's victory and Harrison's victory secured the Western frontier, which left Lake Champlain now the most likely route for a British invasion, which meant another round of wilderness construction for the Browns. Lake Champlain is a good example of history repeating itself. It was used as a battlefield in both the French and Indian War and the American Revolution for the same reason. Each time, or there's no thoroughfares that exist between the mountainous, forested uh, northern border, like I mentioned. An army could march through it slowly, uh, but it's extremely difficult to transport all the artillery, ammunition, supplies, and logistic support to feed and supply that army by a, a single file horse drawn wagon train. But whoever can control this lake could easily ferry all of those with a fraction of the time and effort. And prior to Perry's victory, Master Commandant Thomas McDonough's little fleet of gunboats and converted merchantmen were more than enough to keep the British at bay. But then in the winter of 1813, 1814, the British began a building program to remove McDonough from the lake. Soon after, McDonough's meager squadron wasn't going to suffice. And in January, 1814, Secretary Jones approved the construction of a 24 gun ship and four gunboats. 
and Jones, now an admirer of the Browns, contracted them for construction within 60 days. And he informed uh, McDonough that Mr. Brown of New York will build her in less time than any other builder. Both Browns this time uh, joined McDonough in Virgins, uh, Vermont. It's, uh, excuse me, for another season of wilderness construction. The, the little village sat seven miles up Otter Creek and was not nearly as austere as Presque Isle, thankfully. There were falls nearby that provided power, water power and nearby Moncton Ironworks produced nails, iron spikes and other needs. Once there, Brown's team built barracks and began collecting timber. McDonough found, just as Perry did, that after consulting the Browns on construction requirements, they really didn't need any further supervision. So he was able to, like Perry, focus on his manpower shortage, acquiring our ammunition, and planning his defense of the lake. Now, also like at Presque Isle, timber was abundant, but time was not. The Browns had to use the shortcuts and methods that they developed at Lake Erie to have any hope of outbuilding the British. They could only use the best available timber, again, unseasoned and shaped in the simplest ways. They used things like heavy clamps instead of our reinforcing knees to help support deck beams. And one of the unintended consequences of that blockade that I mentioned earlier on the East Coast was that the shipbuilding industry came to a complete halt. But that also meant that there were lots of ship carpenters out of work looking for work. So with that, the Browns were able to hire a massive crew to deliver the Corvette Saratoga in 40 days, well within the 60 that they were allotted. And they also built another six gunboats and repaired another three. Can we go on? There, oops, okay. Now McDonough considered the Saratoga, his flagship, a fine ship. She stales and works well. At 734 tons, 143 feet long and 36 feet wide, the Corvette was the largest ship on the lake. And here we have another ship type, Corvette. This is a, a sixth rate, meaning it's smaller than a frigate, but larger than a sloop. Uh, usually three masts, square rigged, uh, and armed with 20 to 28 guns on a single deck. Uh, if you've ever seen the great movie Master and Commander, HMS Surprise is a perfect example to think of. Now, while the Browns worked on Saratoga, Secretary Jones sought other options to maintain parity on the lake. He encouraged McDonough to purchase a steamboat, Ticonderoga, currently under construction on Lake Champlain. He had hoped to make the world's first steam-powered warship on the lake. However, after referring with the Browns, McDonough reported rather frankly, this is one of my favorite quotes from him, uh, it cannot be done within two months. Owing to the machinery not being complete, and none of it being here. This, this delay and the extreme liability of the machinery composed of so many parts getting out of order and no spare parts to replace. Uh, so yeah, maybe the only simpler way is we can't make it a steam powered warship when there's no steam engine here. Uh, but McDonough wasn't sold the lemon. The Browns did agree to fit out the Ticonderoga as a 20 gun schooner in two weeks. Now this may sound like an easy task. There was a hull built after all, but converting an almost steam-powered warship, uh, or an almost steamship, into a schooner-rigged warship is no simple task. Lake-bound steamships did not require a substantial keel, because they had all that heavy machinery on or below the deck. You can see here, I have a diagram of the Phoenix. It was a steamship that was built on the lake shortly after the war. This is likely what the Ticonderoga was meant to look like. You can see a flat bottom, all that machinery uh, below the deck there and the huge side wheels. And the heavy mass and rigging that then go into a, uh, a sailing vessel, that's gonna require that larger keel. And then adding cannons on top of that for a warship only further confound it. And then the Ticonderoga was unnaturally narrow for a sailing ship because it no longer needed those side wheels on the side. Uh, to put that into perspective, it's 120 foot length was about 84% of the Saratoga's length, but it was only 67% the beam or the width. So oddly narrow. This makes it, uh, when loaded with, Kevin, uh, loaded with cannons, especially susceptible to hogging, which is that stress that's gonna bend the keel upward. 
So to prevent this, the Browns added 14 inches of keel depth to stiffen the hull, improve stability, resist lateral drift, and increase longitudinal strength. They also reinforced the decks to support the weight of the cannons, the mass, and rigging. And after only two weeks of work, they launched and rigged the Ticonderoga. Their work, their contracts now finally complete, they returned to New York where they were sung praises in the local newspapers. Uh, one had wrote, the, the country is much indebted to Mr. Brown, master builders, for their exertions in completing these vessels in season to secure mastery of the lake. Unfortunately, the press came out a little too soon. Uh, superior, McDonough's superior, superiority on the lake, excuse me, uh, did not last that long. He had his spies over on the Canadian side and there were British deserters that spoke of uh, gunboats and being delivered and a keel being laid for a ship equal to or greater than the Saratoga. To Secretary Jones, McDonough expressed hope that the enemy would meet us with what force they had completed, but worried he intends risking nothing, but will endeavor to outbuild us. It soon became evident that this new ship was going to be a frigate and it would easily outmatch anything that McDonough had. At their current pace, the British would complete the frigate shortly before the winter weather set in, ending the uh, active season of fighting on the lake. McDonough had little time to prepare anything in response. He kept warning Jones of the shifting balance of power and requested to build a schooner or brig, anything to try and gain parity again. He expected construction, uh, that once construction of this frigate was complete, that the British will make a bold attempt to sweep the lake. And behind that British squadron was General Sir George Prevost, a governor general of Upper Canada. And he had raised an army of 14,000 men. This was the largest army yet assembled in North America. And many of them recently from the Peninsular Campaign where they beat Napoleon, so well-seasoned men. If McDonough failed, that army could then march straight to New York and split the country in two. Thankfully, on July 18th, 1814, a small boat came alongside the Saratoga. McDonough probably expected uh, some provisions and hoped for much needed uh, sailors, but instead relief of, from his worries came over the side in the form of Adam Brown. Brown carried a contract for a new brig and had 200 men already waiting back in Virginia's. Understanding the urgency, he and his crew left New York within 24 hours of receiving their contract. This time, Noah Brown remained in New York to oversee the shipyard. And uh, they traveled so swiftly that Jones's instructions to McDonough were still days behind them. Though McDonough remained with the squadron blockading the British while Brown returned to Virginia's to begin construction. He and his men spent the first four days in preparation contracted the Moncton Iron Works, uh, building stocks and scaffolding, cutting, trimming, and sorting the timber. And then they reused their designs for the Briggs, Lawrence, and Niagara. Like, why break what's, what you already have working? This project was the culmination of the Browns' expeditious and expedient shipbuilding methods. Browns had to use green timbers, uh, unriveted keel bolts, no inner stern posts. The deck beams weren't reinforced. Most frames edges were unfinished. Some entire faces still had the tree surface on them. The iron spikes fastening, or they used iron spikes fastening the exterior planks rather than time consuming, but more resilient trenels. Instead of a proper capstan to wind the anchor table, Brown fastened a, a, a log to a bit post and to use as a windlass. I like to think that this is a ship that looked like only a mother could love, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> However, archaeological evidence does show that despite all these shortcuts and uh, this emphasis on speedy construction, uh, that uh, they built a good, a strong, reliable warship. The Eagle launched on August 11th, only 19 days after laying the keel. By August 21st, the Eagle was seaworthy enough to join the rest of the squadron, although Brown and some of his men were still completing projects uh, on, on board. The addition of this 20-gun ship wouldn't allow McDonough to overwhelm the British uh, squadron on the lake, but it did provide an, a nearly even number of ships and broadside weight for the two squadrons. Now, as Brown completed the Eagle, McDonough set about his defense of the lake. 
And he arranged it masterfully. Let me see. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Um, the, British com uh, the British completed their frigate Confiance in early September. And on the morning of September 11th, they set sail to remove McDonough from the lake. Now, as I mentioned, McDonough set this trap essentially masterfully by setting his uh, squadron in line at anchor in Plattsburgh Bay. So why go at anchor? Uh, he doesn't have enough men. He, he can't both sail the ship and fire the guns. And so he needs no one in the, the rigging for this. They're not gonna get close enough to also need Marines up at, uh, to be snipers up above. So he has, and then also at anchor, you're only using one broad, broadside. So he has full crews on uh, all there. Whereas the British are coming down, they need to be both maneuvering while they're fighting. And again, with this position, as you can see here, the current is going northward on Lake Champlain. They need a wind, a uh, southerly wind coming from the north to push them against that current. And by being in Cumberland, uh, behind Cumberland head there, they have to then turn, tack around, then face into the wind, all while being under fire from the uh, McDonough squadron. So again, masterfully is putting it lightly. Um, and that's why after only a couple of hours, it was an unequivocal American victory. And there were many contributing factors to the British defeat. Again, some of them, McDonough's masterful planning. I can go on and on about this. Uh, I will try not to right now though. Um, another reason the British had a revolving door of commanders on the lake that they just weren't satisfied with them and put a lot of pressure on Lieutenant Downey who ended up being the commander at the end there. Unfortunately, he was lost in the opening minutes of the battle when a shot from the Saratoga hit a cannon on the Confiance, you can see right there, um, and crushed him fatally, it flew from the carriage. Uh, it's now a, a trophy cannon outside McDonough Hall at the US Naval Academy. Uh, my son, you can see there, was a little more interested in seeing if he fits in it the last time we were there. <laughs> there. So this battle was 55 days after the Browns received their contract to build the Eagle, and only three weeks after the brig joined the squadron. Adam Brown's quick work gave McDonough adequate firepower and, for his defense, and more importantly, the time to prepare his squadron. Again, that masterful plan that he had. He was able to do all of these rehearsals because it wasn't even just that. He also set up the Saratoga at anchor so he could wind anchor, meaning that when he expended every cannon, every cannon was shot out on one side. In a moment's notice, he could flip it around and it was the, the final blow that ended the battle, basically. But while he's doing these rehearsals, the Confiance is making its way south to the battle, still setting its rigging much less knowing who's in what gun crew. Now, U.S. Army Major General Alexander Maycomb, he didn't have the forces capable of repelling Prabot if they lost. And like I mentioned earlier, the British would have been able to march to New York and separate New England from the rest of the country. And many in New England were already considering secession. There was so much dissatisfaction over what they called Mr. Madison's War at the Hartford Convention a few months later in December 1814. So it's only imagine what that sentiment would be like if they were then isolated from the rest of the country. But instead, McDonough's victory halted the British invasion. And after the battle, Prabot had to admit the impracticality of carrying on any operation without sufficient naval cooperation it, uh, has caused me to turn the whole of my attention to Upper Canada. McDonough's mastery of the lake ensured that the US and Canada maintained their boundaries at the end of the war. Now, Despite this massive victory, the war still was not over yet, and neither was it over for the Browns. It was only the day before on Lake Ontario, the British launched the HMS St. Lawrence, a 102 gun ship of the line. This was larger and more powerful than Nelson's flagship at Trafalgar victory. The arrival of the HMS Lawrence exponentially changed the shipbuilding race on, uh, in the War of 1812. In response, Secretary Jones ordered Chauncey to build three ships of the line and contracted the Browns and, his, and Chauncey's chief builder, Henry Eckford, uh, to, for the work. Jones wanted a decisive battle like he had in Erie and Champlain, 
uh, to secure the American Northwest once and for, for all. And he wanted to stop this runaway spending. He had uh, lamented to President Madison that uh, the naval contest on Lake Ontario has become a warfare of dockyards. It's too good of a quote to not use as my title for this. Now, the Browns arrived at Sackett's Harbor in February, 1815 with 1,200 carpenters and laborers to start construction on the Chippewa. But work stopped six weeks later when news of the Treaty of Ghent arrived. The war this time finally was over and they were only another six weeks from completing this massive ship. So for self-taught shipbuilders, the Browns, their accomplishments during the War of 1812 seem far-fetched. And I didn't even include all of it. In addition to all of these, they also collaborated with Robert Fulton, the guy who created the Claremont, the first uh, commercially viable steam-powered ship. Uh, and also they built the Demologus with him, the world's first steam-powered warship. Uh, so didn't get with Ticonderoga, but they still got it in there. Uh, and they built a submarine with him, uh, in addition to many other ships. But despite uh, involvement in so many key moments in the war, there are best footnotes to the battles that they enabled. Worse yet, they paid up front for a lot of these, especially the Eagle, the Malagas, and the Chippewa, and they were never fully reimbursed in their own lifetime. Ultimately, neither side truly won the War of 1812, but Noah and Adam Brown made sure that the U.S. didn't lose it. Their success with the Peacock and the Privateers speaks to their skills, but it's really their work on the lakes that should define them. Their swift, innovative craftsmanship, resourcefulness, and inspiring leadership to get so many to work so hard in such miserable conditions on Lakes Erie and Champlain, they would have, we would have been lost without them. The U.S. owes Perry and McDonough for maintaining the nation's borders, but we're indebted to Noah and Adam Brown for enabling them to do so. So I hope I've convinced you that the Browns did something special during, World, or during the War of 1812, but I think there's even more that can be taken from their story that uh, in regards to our modern Navy and maritime industry. One lesson comes from the expedient construction methods that the Browns used. We probably shouldn't build ships that are meant to last a single decisive engagement. Uh, those were extenuating circumstances, emergency situations, certainly not the norm. Because yeah, ships, aircraft, other assets, and the sailors that operate them, they're not expendable. But maybe they also shouldn't be built at a price and could be, or they rather they could be built at a price and at a volume that the loss of one isn't a catastrophic loss to a greater national strategy. Um, uh, an example of that really is more recently is looking at LHD-6, uh, Bonhomme Richard, lost two years ago in a fire while pierside. Uh, that is going to have effects for generations on the additional LHDs trying to take up the gap of the operational tempo for that since there's no, uh, no ship under construction right now to replace it. And I believe that there's a possible solution to this problem in what I like to think of as the Brown's secret weapon. See, in the pre-war uh, War of 1812, the United States had a massive uh, thriving shipbuilding industry. The Browns were just one of many shipbuilding firms in New York alone. There were, there's books written about just the maritime industry of New York in this period. That industry required and developed a large skilled workforce and robust infrastructure. The Brown's expertise helped them develop these shortcuts that they used, but it was this massive skilled workforce that they had with them that was the real secret weapon. My presentation began with Noah Brown and 25 carpenters um, going to Lake Erie, but they eventually had hundreds there. And as I mentioned on Lake Ontario, they, had, they were going into the thousands. It was 1,200 for Brown alone. And then Henry Eckford had additional thousands there. The ability to shift a large skilled workforce from a commercial shipping construction to naval shipbuilding when necessary was a key component to these victories at the lake that's often overlooked. A similar popular comparison can be made to the United States uh, large industrial base in the early 20th century that was able to facilitate that naval construction during World War II. And then when you go along this line of argument, it begs the question, where are we now? Well, peak post-World War II uh, shipbuilding employment, again, that's just one indicator, by no means the end all of it. 
that peak employment was 178,000 in 1981. It declined down to 84,000 in 2001, but has been steadily increasing to about 107,000 today. For some perspective of that, the Brown Shipbuilding Company here in Houston, no relation actually to Adam and Noah, during the height of World War II, they employed 25,000 men alone just then. Now, at the top of this, I had that disclaimer again. I'm not an expert in shipbuilding or procurement or national strategy for that matter. I don't know what the correct number of ships to be built, commercial or naval, or the correct number of shipbuilders to be employed should be. Uh, but I am inclined to think more is at least the right answer. I hope this presentation has given you an appreciation for the Brown brothers' accomplishments during the War of 1812, but perhaps more importantly, an appreciation for that in intrinsic relationship between a strong commercial shipbuilding industry and the strength of a Navy. I don't think I'm going out on a limb too much for an audience at the Houston Maritime Center saying something like that. Uh, and that's where my request to you comes in is, please share this story. Uh, far too often, uh, the naval and commercial maritime industry communities, uh, when we talk about the need for more ships, more shipbuilding, bigger shipbuilding industry, it becomes singing to the choir and gets lost in the echo chamber. And one of my hopes with this story is uh, I want to pay tribute to the Browns. They did amazing work and deserve recognition for it. But it's also a way to get other people in on this conversation um, if you care about our, our shipbuilding industry. So again, please share it with a wider audience if you can. And with that, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, where to find more. So I, I greatly appreciate your time and attention this evening. And I'm extremely grateful to the Houston Maritime Center for hosting me to allow, let me talk about this story that I'm so passionate about. Um, if you're interested, you can find more of my work, uh, uh, including an article on the Brown Brothers and most recent Naval History Magazine. Uh, most of my work is at, uh, you can find online at the USNI website or at SIMSEC, the Center for International Maritime Security. Or if you're looking for something a little different, I've been uh, very lucky to participate in NavyCon and the Joint Geeks podcast, where we discuss topics that are at the intersection of military history, science fiction, and national defense. Um, otherwise, you can always find me on various social medias where I'll be uh, talking about old work and posting what's coming up. And uh, now that I've gone on for my, my full allotment of time, I believe, uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Yeah. How long did those ships survive between the Gulf of Guinea and Did they have a very short lifespan? They did. A lot of them were basically sold off at the end of the war. Um, there's, uh, like, as I mentioned on Lake Champlain, that there have been several battles fought there over uh, multiple wars. The underwater archaeology industry, like there's an industry of that on Lake Champlain, of not just them, but also all the steamships there too. Um, you can actually see the remains of the Ticonderoga there. Uh, it doesn't look like much. It's uh, basically a uh, open-faced barn, essentially, with just a lot of logs underneath. That a lot of them, yeah, they they weren't built great. Like they were they were built great for what they were needed for, but they weren't built to last. There wasn't really that intention. So a lot of them really didn't survive the war or sold for scrap, essentially. Yes. Were the Browns their own naval architects or did they employ naval architects? Uh, good question. So essentially they they were they were master shipbuilders and that they they followed others' designs. They weren't the architects. Um, but with that, like all of those shortcuts that they used, that was their expertise. So they're, they're going off of designs that somebody is sending them. Um, like for the, the case of the Peacock, it's uh, William Dowdy, I believe is his name, was the, the new naval constructor that was hired during the war. He's the one that created the design for the Peacock. So they built to his specifications. Um, but also, as I kind of mentioned with Chauncey in the beginning, that it was very normal at that time uh, for the, 
the first captain of the ship is generally like a superintendent of that ship. Uh, you see this, especially with those first six frigates, uh, where that first captain, he's overseeing the project, and then there's the, the chief constructor the, or the chief builder for it. And they're, they're making tweaks to make it work, essentially. Any others? Yes. Uh, did they use brass cannons or iron cannons, and how did they get it? How did they get the? Oh, that is a very good question. Uh, there's actually, an, uh, it's a topic of mine that I really enjoy that I don't know enough about yet. There's a great book by um, Tucker is his name. Uh, I think it's Arming the Fleet is a great resource for that. That's about trying to find those because we didn't have that many foundries. Like it was a big issue, especially starting all the way back in the American Revolution, just trying to get cannons. I forget where I read an article recently about it. It was great. Um, but yeah, no, they weren't, uh, I don't believe they were brass cannons uh, that they were using out on the lakes. Um, but yeah, I'm not positive uh, where, where exactly they would have gotten them from. I know the, the British were actually, theirs probably came, they may have come from England. Um, and a lot of, or maybe they have a foundry in Halifax. I'm not, I can't be too certain of that, but they actually were shipping in um, the gunboats like from Halifax. Sometimes things were being assembled there. And I don't have this uh, for certain, but I, they may have even been building some of the frames of the Confiance like in Halifax and then bringing it by barge down the St. Lawrence River to there. So they had that benefit. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was, uh, where did they get their cannons from? Were they brass cannons um, or, or something else? And yeah, most likely iron cannons and probably from uh, New Jersey, I think, is where most of our foundries were at the time. Good question. Any others? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was one of the things that kind of first, uh, first attracted me to this is I was doing other research. And yeah, there'd be this, this note like, hey, and they laid the keel in 19 days. I'm like, how is that possible? And then started connecting the dots seeing like, oh, these guys were also at this battle here and that battle there. Why, why is nobody talking about them type of thing and just starting to pull the thread. But yeah, that it was those that obvious accomplishment that kind of sparked the interest. Yes. Can you, can you describe what laying the keel? Yes. Yeah. Th a very good question. And again, back to the original disclaimer: a marine talking boat stuff. Uh, so I might mess something up here, and I apologize. Uh, but yes. Yeah, so the keel is essentially the backbone of the ship. Let's see if I can maybe. Oh. Oh, did I exit it? Sorry. Oh. Um, if you can use your memory, back to that picture that I had of the um, the skeleton of the ship with all all the frames going out. It almost looks like a, a whale skeleton in a sense. Uh, the keel is that backbone of it on the bottom. So laying the keel then is you're getting the, those best planks, uh, strongest wood and you're, you're, it's called scarfing them together, essentially trying to make it one strong backbone because it, I keep saying backbone because that's what it is. It's the strongest, it needs to be the strongest part of the ship uh, to avoid that hogging that I was showing that, uh, that yeah, if it, if it's not built right, you're going to get that force going up there that's going to basically break, break the ship. Yeah, good question. Yes. I thought it was odd that uh, about half of the locations for building a ship were right across the river from in Canada. They were so close to the enemy force that they make, make a day trip. And, yes. And yeah. Yeah. Especially on Lake Erie, where, like, again, they, they had those two uh, construction sites. Um, and uh, I didn't get into it too much for the time, but there, there is some rationale with them there and that uh, Daniel Dobbins was praising uh, uh, Presque Isle because part, part of it was that bar that it provided some protection that nobody's gonna be doing a raiding party into them there, uh, also kept them in there. But again, they had that workaround. Whereas Fort Erie, yeah, like they, it was, it's not a deep water port by any means. It's a creek along feeding into a lake. Uh, but it, they didn't have that issue there. But again, like you said, it's so close. It's so close that they were being bombarded 
right there. Um, in uh, Lake Champlain, it was a little different in that they were at the other ends of the, the this long lake. But yeah, it, it, they were they were within sight at times, like they mentioned, three miles away uh, at Lake Erie uh, when when they're roving the lake. I can't imagine doing that today. <laughs> Anything else? All right, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time and attention. This is a story I'm very passionate about and was very excited to share with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I do encourage you all to, again, look at the website because we are uh, right now filling out our calendar for the following for the rest of the year for history and industry lectures. Welcome. Thank you for coming.